Welcome, thank you. My name is Mark Hoyne. I'm the chair of the Life Science Group of the law firm and also a co-founder and current executive chairman of the biotech company that develops non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Today I want to talk about what I actually love doing, uh, that's patent law, but for three reasons. One, it involves science, law, and business. So I want to combine all three of them and talk about innovation. Um, I kind of gave my conclusion, but I want to kind of walk through it to show you how innovation is value creation by going through four stories uh, that are illustrations, two definitions, and then trying to have some resolution on what innovation is and what it's not, and how it impacts us. So my first story is the scientist. The scientist actually is two scientists. They're PhD students that, that work together, collaborate, work through in the university setting. And they are working in different areas, one on the function, maybe one on the structure, developing antibodies. Over years of research, they finally develop an antibody after changing the variable region, and maybe they uh, one of the different regions of the antibody. And they test it in uh, small animals, and they actually show that it actually can work and, and therapeutically help people in certain types of cancers. They rush off to their university technology transfer office, file an invention disclosure form, file a patent application. After a couple of more years of doing some more work, the university makes a big deal with the pharmaceutical company to license out the antibodies. Pharmaceutical spends another probably five to seven years trying to develop it. It gets on the market. It's now being used to treat pa patients with certain types of cancers. Two, the two developers are still at the university. They became professors. Previously, they were assistant professors. They now are sitting, still doing their research under grant applications, and they're highly successful scientists in the field. Story number one. Story number two, the executive. The executive, she got her undergraduate degree in chemistry. She then went on to medical school. After medical school, did a stint in a pharmaceutical company in the regulatory area. After that, spending two or three years in doing regulatory development for the pharmaceutical company, she then went back into this, to the market in terms of an, uh, doing analyst work for a firm, spending five or six years there, but yet never really operating anything. She always had this huge amount of knowledge, always the due diligence for her, for her other, for the potential companies or other people. Finally, she does a survey of all the companies in her area, and she figures that she wants to operate a company. So she takes on the CEO role of a private, mid-sized biotech company. She spends two years changing a lot of things, both operationally, in terms of the regulatory approach, during the messaging, and then the company actually turns around, goes public, and she is now a successful CEO. Story number three is the fund. The fund is, as it's called, the fund. It's a fund that has a lot of money, usually invests in companies, but here they have kind of scientists or technology people that are sitting and waiting to move into companies. There are two people that haven't moved into any particular company, have been successful from exits that they worked on before, and they basically survey the field, and they see the market opportunities in a number of fields, and they decide that health-related software is an underused area, that the health system is a mess, the doctors, yes, they're using their, their pads and they're using a lot of now new electronic things, but if they can aggregate certain different technologies that are out there and they can bring it to the market, they can have a huge upside potential. So they go out, they find a small little company, they grow it based on the, the upside market potential, they get some of their own funds in and other funds, and now they're one of the largest healthcare software providers in the industry. The fourth story. The fourth story is a teenager. He's a 17-year-old boy that now is spending his first day in the R&D center of a high-tech company in Europe. He looks back to his day before, which is probably was his most proudest moment, where he was paid by a high-tech company about $30 million. Because two years before, at age 15, he was playing with his iPhone and he discovered that, you know, it's not so efficient, the app. I can make a better app. So he spent the next two years developing an app. And those two years paid off. He now is 17, didn't have to apply for a job in the high-tech company because they just bought him out. Those are four stories. So now, I want to talk about two definitions here, which kind of, I want to use one as a foil, but kind of get to innovation. Because a lot of people use innovation as a buzzword, which is a good buzzword. You never hear anybody saying, oh, he's an innovator, and that means bad. 
usually it's been good, right? He's doing something. But if you kind of look, it's kind of nebulous. It's kind of like, hmm, I know it's a good thing, right? We have people that are, you know, that are defined as innovators. We have cities, we have areas, we have Silicon Valley, we have countries. We have a lot of things that are innovators. But if you kind of try to define it, then people will try to use different terms. So I want to kind of now maybe be a little technical and go back to something that is more my area and then kind of go forward into something that certainly is not. So I want to call this part innovation versus invention. And my first one is a definition here, and it'll be short, it's to define what an invention is. And this is a standard definition, it's a legal definition, so I know one is correct. Okay? And what an invention is, is whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacturer, or composition of matter thereof, or any improvement is entitled to a patent. So you know if somebody says, I have a patent, then therefore, under the law, and every country varies, but more or less this is more or less correct, that under the law, then he, he invented something that is, one, has utility, that means has a use. It is novel, that means it's new. It's not obvious, meaning some incremental change made it, there was something not obvious. And some detailed description that enables one skill in the art to make and use the invention, which just means is that they will use words that actually define what they did and how you can do it. Okay? So that's an invention. Now, there are very, what's one thing that's important about inventions, besides being new, is that it's done by very few people. If you look at who you say invented something, it's usually on the face of the pattern, and it's usually a few people. It's not the entire company, it's certainly not the business people, it's not the marketing people, very rarely the regulatory people, it's usually the scientists. Okay? The other definition I want to talk about now is one thing in terms of distinctiveness and differences. In inventions, you have only what you highlight as the distinctive or differences. You don't look at commonality. You look at what is, makes it different. If you have an antibody with one mutation in it, or one change in one region, or you have an electronic device, or you have some type of protein or something else, or a chemistry, you have a substituent in one of the R groupings that you put on there, that difference can have a radical functional difference. Why? In some types of protein chemistry or some kind of acid antibodies, it can either make what you're doing work or not. And that's a big difference. So in pattern law, you look at the differences or the distinctions. When you have words like radical, paradigm shifting, you have disruptive, transformatory, commercial success, usually those words aren't exactly tied to inventions, they're usually tied to innovations. When you say let's you know, give value, they're not usually saying specifically to inventions. So I looked up what innovation means, because I actually applied yesterday, and I said, you know, we use innovation a lot. Like, let's try to get a definition of it. So I took the OED, uh, this is second edition, but I looked at OED, and what, what I looked at it is said the first kind of wording was the action of innovation, the introduction of novelties. So my kids have two rules with me. One is whenever I use a word that they don't know, if I use it in a sentence, but just in a different form, but it's the same word, like the act of innovating as a definition for invention, I'm usually wrong. That's one rule. The second rule is if I use a bigger word to define a word I want to ask them about, I'm also wrong. So I have those two rules with my children. But here they say the act of innovating. So I know it's not an act of innovating because you can't define something by itself. The second one I thought was interesting is the introduction of novelties. And then if you go to innovate, it's to change something to new to alter renew. Again, I just defined what invention was. So I know an invention is something new. To say an innovation is something new doesn't help me in the definition. So an innovation can't be just something that's new. Because therefore, everything you do would be new, that's new would be an innovation. We know that's not true. Okay? We know that it may be an invention, but we know it's not always an innovation. The innovation and invention are two mutually exclusive words. You can have inventions that are innovations, and you can have innovations that are inventions. So what does innovation mean? I was thinking about this a little and applying it to my clients and colleagues and friends and what they do. And to me, I think it's value creation. And I was going back on the definition of why I think it's value creation. Because I take my four stories now. Okay? In all four stories, there is value creation. Okay? There's not always an invention, but there's always value creation. 
In the first story, you had the scientists. You had both scientists that discovered something. They discovered a new antibody. Okay? They developed it. Now, yes, they didn't do the commercialization of it. That came with the pharmaceutical company. They didn't do the marketing. They didn't do the regulatory. But they actually discovered something new. And they synthetically made that something new. And they licensed it out. They created value. They would be called innovators. Okay? In the second situation, the executive didn't invent anything. She came on board the company, she changed the marketing plan, she gave value to the company, she created value. She didn't create invention, but she was an innovator. If she was in one of the biotech companies in any country that actually had a very nice exit or a very nice approach to the market, they would say that she's an innovator. In my third story, you had the fun guys, they saw a market opportunity, they were innovators. They didn't look at it from the invention point of view, they didn't look at it from the regulatory point of view, they looked at it from the market opportunity point of view, saw a market that maybe needed something, and then they created that market. And the fourth example was the teenager. And the teenager, you had, the, he created an app, but that may or may not be compatible, probably in most jurisdictions it's not, but he was an innovator. By the way, that's, some, that's actually a true story. Um, that happened a couple of months ago. So you have situations where you have innovation, which happened, but not inventions. So in all, but in all cases, an innovation is something that creates value. So how do you create value? And I'm the one to part of you. This is the emphasis of what I want to share with everybody. In inventions, it's a few people. Okay? A few smart people, a few lucky people, but it's a few people. In innovation, it's all of us. It's everybody. The, the chain of how you create value is incremental from the very beginning of making an invention all the way through to the commercial success. And there are many paths which companies, people take to innovate. And in all of those paths, it requires sometimes one person by sheer force, which is fine, but other times it, 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 it usually a lot more people have to come on board in terms of consensus sometimes, in terms of being part of the team, in terms of participating with other people. Everybody here and everybody in when they want to innovate, everybody has a role to play. You just have to play that role. Okay? You have to participate in that to actually make it happen. So we had the age of the Industrial Revolution. We had the age of information. I think we're moving into the age of innovation, where it's not a few, but it's many that contribute to innovative technologies. And it requires everybody to increase value to get to that innovation. Thank you very much.